I'm NASA astronaut Jessica Meir. I may be one of the first people to return to the moon. The Artemis mission has this stated goal of sending the first woman and the first person of color to the surface of the moon. It will have been over 50 years since humans have set foot there. We aren't just going to go there once and then come back or go there a few times like in the Apollo missions and then come back. We're going to keep this presence going with a gateway program that will be an outpost in orbit around the moon. Think of it kind of like a little mini space station with subsequent missions of landings on the moon and then eventually using all of that time and knowledge in those lunar missions as a springboard to go even further and go to Mars. My mom tells me I first started saying I wanted to be an astronaut when I was five years old. So it actually was quite difficult to believe when it came true in 2013 when the phone rang and I was given the option to come here to NASA to be an astronaut. It's almost felt surreal. Copy Jessica's egressing, 10 seconds to a 20 second handover. Coming out of the hatch for your first spacewalk is a moment that I don't think anyone ever forgets. My first spacewalk happened to be only a few weeks after I arrived on the space station. So at that point, I was still learning how to move and navigate myself around on the space station. That day, I was with my colleague and friend, Christina Cook. She was in the same class of astronauts as me, so we really are like astronaut siblings. She's like my space sister. We were ready to go out of the hatch that day for the first all-female spacewalk. Of course, there had been other women that had done spacewalks before us. We were the 14th and 15th women to do so. But this was the first time that two women together were going to embark on a spacewalk. So there I am, and I'm looking down at my feet, dangling below the hatch, and then there is nothing else between this earth spinning below and my feet. And that was just the most profound moment. I was just in awe and so excited. Just us up there. We're floating the whole time, going around our planet every 90 minutes. It was still, even though I was living it, even though I understood the science behind why I was there, it was still difficult to believe that it was actually happening. So it was really only after the spacewalk ended that I started thinking more about what it meant. And it was interesting because in the beginning I thought, why does it matter? Why is there so much attention being drawn to this first all-female spacewalk? It just happens to be the, f the fact that right now there are two women going out the door. We're just as qualified as everybody else up here. And so it's just a matter of time that this would happen. But then when I started thinking about it differently, so many people tuned in to watch that spacewalk. And so many people started giving us this feedback about how inspiring it was for them and how much it meant for them. And that really took me a little bit by surprise. And I also started thinking more about the generations that came before us. So Christina and I, both of us, when we look at this now, we don't think about it as our personal achievement. We had that opportunity because of the generations of women and other minorities that had worked so hard, that had truly pushed the envelope and broken those glass ceilings to allow us to be where we were. So now when we look toward the future and we look at the Artemis program, this administration has set forth the goal that we will be sending the first woman and the first person of color to the surface of the moon. Of course, I would be absolutely thrilled to be that person, to be one of these first people returning to the moon. And to me, it would represent so much. I know somebody asked me once what I would say, what would be those, those first words, like we have those famous first words from the Apollo mission. And that is something I would have to put a lot of thought into. I think it, to me it would be a little bit like how I describe that first all-female spacewalk. It wouldn't be about my achievement. It would be about the achievement of everybody on this NASA team that got there. And it wouldn't even only be limited to that. Really, that next person that goes to the moon is a representative of all of humanity. So a lot of people ask us, why haven't we been back to the moon? If we did this 50 years ago, why is it so difficult? Why haven't we been doing it? There's nothing easy about going to the moon. What we accomplished in the 60s was extraordinary. We are due to go back to the moon for so many reasons. The first is simply for exploration. 
It is an inherent characteristic inside us as humans to explore, to want to look around the corner, to go further, to ask those questions and just quench that curiosity that we have. Secondly though, and equally as important, is for scientific reasons. If we look back at the Apollo missions, we learn so much about the, our solar system, about the formation of our planet and of the moon, and I know that that will be true as well for the Artemis missions. For example, we'll be targeting the South Pole because at that area, we know that there is much more frozen water. So by going to that spot, we can study and understand that water, that ice, that frozen water will help us understand more about the moon, about our solar system, and it will also be a resource. We can use oxygen in the soil, we can use that frozen water in the surface, we can use that to make fuel, to make resources for further exploration. So that would be that next step. Take what we learn in the proving ground around the moon and now use that to get to Mars where we need to be autonomous. We need to think about things like sustainable food systems. We won't even be able to necessarily carry all the food and water that we need up there. So maybe we wanna bring some things that we can grow. Everything that we learn in these early Artemis missions to the moon will apply then on to Mars. Fairly soon, we will be launching that Artemis 1 test mission, and that mission will be about three weeks. It will go all the way out to the moon and beyond it, and we will test out all of those systems of the Orion spacecraft and that launch system. The next mission, the Artemis 2 mission, would have crew members on it. So that will be the first mission that has astronauts going out to the moon. They won't yet land on the surface of the moon, but they will go out again further than the moon. They will be in orbit around the moon before they come back here. So that will be another vital step in making sure we have everything ready and we're prepared for those later missions, which will then land on the surface of the moon. We'll also have the gateway, which will be in orbit around the moon. So think of it kind of like a little mini space station. Instead of being around the Earth, though, it'll be there proximal to the moon. And then we can use that to go back and forth. We can keep people on board the gateway, and then we can have regular excursions down to the surface of the moon. We can use that as a test bed for other hardware and technology and experiments. And then we can eventually use that as a stepping stone to getting to Mars. To me, the moon represents this spirit of exploration that I think has driven humans from the beginning of evolution of our species, and also me personally. The stars, the Milky Way, the moon were so bright in our view, and I think that's something that really shaped part of my childhood, letting that natural scientific curiosity, that spirit of exploration, extend not only from what was in front of me on the ground, but also to what was lying up there above. And of course, the moon is this incredibly prominent object and something that, that I think we're all drawn to. It makes me so optimistic now to know that it is a national priority again. We have laid out this foundation to get back to the moon, so we will return. Today, I am proud to announce that our next New Frontiers mission Dragonfly. Dragonfly. So Dragonfly. Go Dragonfly. We're building a drone the size of a car and we're going to fly it on a moon. Dragonfly will explore Saturn's largest moon, Titan. In 2027, Dragonfly will launch on its 872 million kilometer journey to Titan, the most Earth-like moon we've discovered so far. By the time Dragonfly's baseline mission is over, we'll have flown more than 100 miles, which is almost double the total distance covered by all of the Mars rovers combined. I'm a co-investigator on the Dragonfly mission, and I'm really looking forward to being able to see Titan through Dragonfly's eyes. Titan's been running a big experiment, and it's time for us to go collect the results. Titan is so amazing because in a lot of ways, it's very Earth-like. It's the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. It has rain, it has clouds, it has lakes and rivers and sand dunes and mountains. And so big picture, 
Titan has all the things that we think are required for life. We think that there was a period in Earth's history around the time when life originated, when Earth's atmospheric composition was actually probably quite similar to Titan's atmospheric composition today. And so another one of the questions we have is, you know, what was the chemistry like on the early Earth? How was it related to what's happening on Titan today? And what does that tell us about the origin of life on Earth? Titan is enshrouded in this kind of orangey yellow haze that keeps you from being able to see the surface. And so it was like, okay, we can't see the surface. It's the only moon in the solar system that has an atmosphere. And now we're finding out that there's all of these carbon containing molecules in the atmosphere that are really, really interesting. And Titan is so interesting that we needed to know more about it. Titan is one of the best, if not the best place in the solar system to fly. If you personally were on Titan and you had some kind of wings attached to your arms for some reason, if you flapped your arms, you would actually be able to fly um, under your own power. It's actually, it's, it's that easy. And it's a combination of two things. One thing is that the gravity is pretty low on Titan. It's about one seventh of the gravity on Earth. So that helps um, because you don't need as much, you know, energy to get off of the ground. But the other reason why it's so easy to fly on Titan is that the atmosphere is actually more dense than it is at the surface of Earth. So um, it would be much, much easier, it is much, much easier, um, I think, to try to figure out a concept to fly on Titan versus trying to send a rover. Dragonfly is not a little backyard drone. It's about the size of a small car. And so that makes it you know, pretty robust to a lot of things that a backyard drone would not um, be robust to. Uh, although if it crashes into a tree, um, as long as we know that it crashed into a tree on Titan, we will be super excited. We will call that a successful mission because um, we found life on Titan accidentally. We just don't know that much about the surface. And so on the one hand, that's scientifically exciting. And on the other hand, that's a little scary when you're an engineer that's trying to build a spacecraft where you can't, you know, call AAA if something goes wrong because of the time delay in light travel between Titan and Earth, the dragonfly is going to have to navigate on its own. There isn't going to be somebody, you know, sitting on Earth with a joystick flying um, dragonfly. There's no GPS at Titan. Um, there's nothing to tell it where it is. Our maps that we have right now are not very good. And so kind of one of these a little bit like, you know, build the plane as you're flying it type things um, in terms of how we navigate. And Basically, the way that it's going to be doing that is by taking a really, really lot of images. Where basically every time we fly, we're actually going to fly further than where we want to land so that we can do reconnaissance aerial imaging of the place we think we want to go next. And then we'll turn around and go back to where we had planned to land and land there. Once we tell it, okay, you know, you're gonna go do this thing. It will have the whole sequence of what it needs to do. It will be able to make decisions if something goes wrong um, and it will decide, okay, this is what I'm, what I'm doing now. Um, and then, you know, we'll report back and say, you know, look, mom, I did it, um, hopefully. <laughs> uh, but it definitely, there's definitely a lot of challenges involved in having these big time delays um, because we don't, we can't control anything in real time. We have all these ideas about the requirements for life and big picture we tend to think of the requirements of life as a source of energy, building blocks of life, so like just things that are made out of carbon and some type of liquid. We think that Titan is a place that it has the possibility of, of having um, life. Things that we know we have on Titan are a whole, whole variety of what we call organic molecules. So one of the reasons why we're so excited about carbon when we're thinking about, you know, the search for life and the origin of life is that, um, you know, selfishly, uh, life on Earth is based um, on a lot of carbon containing molecules. And so that's one of the reasons why we're so excited about it. But actually atomically, it's very interesting. Carbon, carbon can make four different bonds. Um, whereas when you look at something like oxygen, which can really only make one bond or two bonds. If you think about your kids' Legos, you can only build so many things with a little like one piece Legos, but when you start using the two or the three or the four or whatever, you start to be able to build these really complicated things. And it's the same thing with carbon because it can make these four bonds. It really allows it to make all of these different kinds of molecules. Um, and we think that we see evidence of a lot of that 
going on in Titan's atmosphere. So we already have a bunch of different simple little Lego structures in the atmosphere. And we just want to know how complicated they got um, and you know whether or not that is you know kind of similar to the level of complexity that we see on on Earth, which might indicate the possibility for the presence of life. And so we want to go and see, you know, with a with an actual Titan scale laboratory, what has formed from these processes. And so, you know, the more opportunities we have to be able to explore places, the fewer limitations we have on answering our science questions, which is really important. This is one of the few places in our solar system where we have a good chance to look for life. There's evidence for a vast subsurface ocean below the icy crust of the moon. The amount of water that's suspected there is many times more than all the oceans together we have on Earth. On the poles you're approaching minus 200 degrees Celsius, icicles that could be several meters high might be present. And if you're very lucky, then you might just spot a plume erupting nearby, like an ice volcano that ejects material from the subsurface to enormous altitudes. Um, on top of that, there's a good chance that there's an energy source at the bottom of the ocean, hydrothermal activity, that can support the emergence of life. That makes uh, Europa outstanding. Europa Clipper is the first mission that goes to the outer solar system that has the exclusive goal to investigate the habitability of the body in the outer solar system. It will launch in October 24 and will arrive at Jupiter in April 2030, so it's five and a half years for Europa Clipper. And Jupiter has like about 70 moons, so the, the number increases like every, every year by a bit. But there are four moons that stand out, that are the so-called Galilean moons. The innermost is Io, then Europa, then Ganymede, and then Callisto. With the telescopic observations before the arrival of the first spacecraft, you could see that some of these moons are really, really bright. They reflect way more light than a rocky surface would. And so, for example, Europa and also Enceladus, they are one of the brightest uh, objects. And so it was suspected already at that time that the surface might be composed of shiny, reflecting water ice. I mean, after the investigations of the uh, Galileo spacecraft in the late 90s, Europa became a prime target in planetary science um, all over the solar system. Because with a huge subsurface ocean, with the spectrotidal thermal activity, that became the first place that could be habitable in our solar system uh, besides maybe Mars. That immediately sparked uh, proposals of missions to go back to Jupiter and specifically investigate Europa. I mean, if you are a planetary scientist, uh, probably the most rewarding science goal is to see if a planetary body is habitable or actually inhabited. So Europa Clipper will stay in orbit around Jupiter and in most of its revolutions, it will have a close flyby at Europa. Um, and the flybys are arranged in a way that it's like a web in the end surrounding the moon that you have in the end a good overview over uh, almost the entire surface after these 50 flybys. During those close flybys, you, you get uh, an idea of what is uh, evaporating from the surface of Europa. And from that, of course, you learn uh, about the makeup, the composition of the surface. And this is, of course, specifically true if there's plume and vatting activity. That's what I really would put a smile on my face if we could measure plume material um, that's connected to the subsurface ocean of Europa. The instrument called SUDA, the Surface Dust Analyzer, is the instrument I'm working on. It measures the composition of tiny grains that are surrounding Europa, mostly ice grains. And these grains are um, knocked off the surface by micrometeoroid impacts. 
with a pseudo instrument, we can sample these materials. And with that, we get an idea uh, about the surface composition. We could constrain what salts were there in the ocean, uh, what the, if there's an alkaline neutral or basic environment, if there's hydrothermal activity at the bottom of the ocean, what the organic chemistry uh, inside the ocean has evolved to. Unfortunately, we currently only have one example of a planetary body or a moon where life exists. And so it's really difficult to speculate about the nature of life elsewhere. If we look for signs of life on an icy moon like Europa, it's probably the most straightforward to just look for uh, simple forms of life. If there would be complex civilizations um, in these subsurface oceans, we probably would have known by now, right? But I know that um, at least for the life on Earth, the access to oxygen is important to develop complex life compared to simple monocellular life. So um, this is one of the big science questions that Europa Clipper wants to answer. Has Europa Ocean access to oxygen that is created on the surface? So is material from the surface cycling back down to the ocean? If yes, then oxygen might be available in the ocean and this opens up the possibility for more complex life. And not just a single cell, but maybe fish like a complex life. Everything between uh, one cell or no life or fish-like life, like complex organisms that might be even intelligent or not, nobody knows. It's really up in the air. I look very much forward to the launch. It will be launched on a, a Falcon Heavy that was decided only a few months ago. So one of Elon Musk's rockets. And I'm really much looking forward because I never saw a rocket launch uh, in my life. I like to see it. But on the other hand, It'll make me nervous. So if the that's always a problem. <laughs> if, if rockets have a chance, even the safest rockets have a chance of like a one percent or two percent, that there's some failure, and uh, then everything was in vain, because all the development has been done. Most instruments have been crafted twice that you have a spare. So I really hope that the launch will go well. So I think it's one of the most exciting missions there is, and I'm really glad that I can participate uh, in these endeavors. This tiny little moon, 500 kilometers in diameter, has proved that it can surprise everybody. Water vapor plumes with organic material coming out of this tiny little moon, who would have thought? I get asked whether Enceladus is my favorite moon, and at the moment it is partly based on the observations that my team made and the discovery that we made at Enceladus. So the Cassini mission was the first uh, spacecraft mission to orbit around Saturn and its moons. It was also the first mission to taste what was in an extraterrestrial ocean. The mission kept being extended and extended, and so in the end the mission lasted for 13 years. The discoveries were pretty radical. We were flabbergasted, to be frank. I think for me, the most surprising discovery that was made was this water vapor plume at Enceladus, which we then followed up with discoveries about a liquid water ocean under the surface, a heat source, organic material. I've now given away all the secrets. <laughs> My team and I changed the course of the mission because this was a team effort. So we had three flybys of Enceladus and two of these flybys were quite distant flybys. In the data that my instrument took, so data from the magnetic field in the environment of Enceladus, we saw some strange signatures that we weren't expecting to see. And what those signatures were telling us was almost as if Enceladus was a bigger obstacle, a bigger body than it looked. We thought maybe we hadn't got the trajectory of the spacecraft back properly, so maybe we were seeing an artifact in the data. But the fact that we saw it on two separate flybys meant that we, we said, okay, we thought we were seeing something. So I actually traveled out to the Jet Propulsion Lab and I was planning to make a presentation to the project because what I wanted to do was I wanted to persuade them that we thought we were seeing this really strange atmospheric signature 
um, and that it would be really good to go close on the third flyby. And I was really nervous because if the flyby changed, that meant all of the plans that we had made for the last six and a half years would have to be changed. And some instruments would not take the data that they'd planned to. But the possibility that we would discover this water vapor atmosphere of Enceladus was exciting enough that the majority of people decided it was worth a go. It was extremely nerve-wracking waiting for that third flyby. So, you know, I'd essentially put my and my team's reputation on the line. And so I must confess, the first, the two or three nights before the flyby, I didn't sleep very well. I tossed and turned a lot. Because if they hadn't found anything, no one would ever have believed anything I said again. You know, every once in a while you have to be brave and you have to say that you think you're seeing something. But luckily they found something. When we had that third flyby, what we found was instead of it being an atmosphere covering the entire surface, there was simply an outgassing of water vapor from the South Pole. In addition to that, because we went so close, all of the other instruments were able to take fantastic data sets as well. And what we found is there were cracks at the South Pole through which this water vapor was escaping. There was an internal heat source. There was organic material. And so that meant we had three of the four things for potential habitability to form. You need a heat source, you need liquid water, you need organic material, and then you need those first three things to be stable enough over a long enough period of time that something can actually happen. So that's when there was a, a real focus on Enceladus for potentially being a place where life or habitability might have been there in the past or might be able to form in the future. The coming together of all of the Enceladus data and the discoveries that were made um, underpins what I think is one of the most important discoveries that has been made in planetary science in the last 30 years. And that is that you don't need to look close to the sun to find liquid water. You can be quite far from the sun, but you can find liquid water it's just not on the surface, it's underneath the surface. And so that's been a, almost been a sea change in planetary science. We now have a, a much better understanding about Enceladus and its internal structure. So we have a global liquid water ocean underneath the surface of Enceladus, and the surface is, is made up mainly of water ice. Biggest unanswered questions for Enceladus are, why is there only a water vapor plume at the South Pole? We still don't quite understand why there's a heat source. Because the fact remains that it was formed billions of years ago. Because it's so small, it should have cooled down. Um, and so we think it might be linked to um, its orbit around Saturn. So if the, if the orbit around the Moon is not completely circular, then on some parts of the orbit it's closer to the planet than on others. And when that happens, tidal forces keep the interior warm. I think Enceladus will always be memorable for me because in some ways it was my way of becoming confident in my, in my ability to persuade people but also confident in my team and what we were able to do with the data. That's probably why it's my favourite moon. Depending on what we discover at Ganymede, it might move slightly down my list. For me, it was almost a coming of age for my team, but also for the instrument. You know, people say to me, why do you explore planets? And for me, we are explorers. Humankind have always been explorers. When we didn't know much about the Earth, people would take ships and, and, and go to what some people said was the edge of the Earth and they were scared they're going to fall off. For me, exploring planets is part of that exploration. It's what we do. My first view of Saturn, actually, was through a telescope that my dad built. I saw Saturn and its rings. Didn't see any of the moons because Saturn is so far away, but we were able to see the rings clearly. And we also saw Jupiter and some of its moons as well. So I never thought back when I was a child that I'd end up doing what I do today. I will never forget Enceladus. In planetary science, it will always be an important thing. And it will be an example that people refer to in the future as well.
It has the biggest volcanic plumes that we know of with exotic sulfurous compositions, the highest temperature lavas that we've detected. It's as hot as 1800 degrees Kelvin. So Io wins lots of awards for being extreme. Some of us love Io just for its own sake, but it's also a, a laboratory for understanding other planets, especially the, the terrestrial planets very early in their history, uh, when they were hotter, they had more heat. Uh, this was a time when, when life first formed, when plate tectonics was getting going, we'd, we'd, in many ways studying very early Earth is like studying another planet. Understanding Io might teach us something fundamental. I'd like to understand that type of volcanic kind of eruption without having one happen on Earth today. That would be unfortunate for all of us living here. Io, that's happening today. Very high fusion rate volcanism. More active than the most active volcanoes we usually have on Earth. And it changes our whole view of how planets work. For terrestrial planets like the Earth and Moon, our thinking is, is that it's kind of like the lifetime of a human being. When you're young, you're energetic and active, and then you get more quiescent and more and more quiescent, then you die. Boring. Well, these outer planet satellites are much more like the Hindu life cycle, where you can be reborn and, and go through all sorts of cycles of activity. So very different concept of how planets work. We have no shortage all of, of unanswered questions and mysteries uh, throughout the solar system and beyond. Right, Io is um, a little bit larger than Earth's moon. Uh, it's one of four large moons of Jupiter. It's the innermost of the four large moons. And three of these moons are in a, a resonance. So every time Ganymede orbits Jupiter once, Europa orbits twice, and Io orbits four times. This means that the, the, the distance to massive Jupiter is varying, and the whole moon changes its shape where the surface of the moon rises and sinks as much as 100 meters. In case of Io, every 42 hours, that changing of shape, it's like bending a piece of metal back and forth. It heats it up. So we've proposed the Io Volcano Observer in the Discovery Program. That's NASA's low-cost category of planetary mission. But uh, this mission would make 10 close flybys of Io while orbiting uh, Jupiter. It has a suite of instruments. And the tour is designed so that we fly by Io at just the right times and places. Uh, in order to measure the, the tidal gravity signature, we have to have pairs of identical flybys, one when Io is closest to Jupiter and one that's otherwise identical, but when Io is furthest from Jupiter. So it sees the same signal, except that this difference in range to, to Jupiter, which changes the shape of, of Io. That'll tell us really what's going on inside Io. Does it really have a magma ocean? And even if it has a magma ocean, what type of magma ocean? That's really, I think, the most fundamental thing. And we need to get a spacecraft that makes close flybys of, of Io at a minimum. Landing on Io and orbiting Io would be even better. You have to understand though, <clears throat> Io is deep within the intense radiation of, of Jupiter. So Jupiter has a very powerful magnetosphere. So it's a very high radiation environment. So it's very tough on electronics. So. You know, we're not going to explore Io the way we have Mars with these long-lived rovers on the surface unless we have a revolution in, in electronics and how, how to withstand the radiation. Um, so fast flybys is, is the way around that for now. Uh, get, get in there close, get a bunch of data, and get out of that radiation as fast as you can. There are volcanic plumes up to several hundred kilometers high, uh, very spectacular, and uh, that some of that material may be uh, it could directly escape Io, but also that high radiation environment and those energetic particles interact and strip off material. If we're so close that we're in flying through a, a lava fountain, <laughs> that would obviously be bad for a spacecraft. Uh, we hope to fly through the upper parts of plumes where it's, it's mostly gas and very small particles that, that are not hazardous. Uh, of course, if you 
make a math error and impact IO, that would not be good unless it was intentional to dispose of the spacecraft at the end of the mission. And that is how we would plan to, to end it all after the, the mission is over. It would mean a great deal to me to see this mission go forward. Now, I'm, I'm not going to be the one leading the mission uh, at I.O. You know, it has to be the next generation. You have to think in terms of multi-generations when you're dealing with the outer solar system, and especially when you have to spend a decade just, just to get the mission approved. Uh, so for me, though, that's all fine. Uh, I get it started, and then I enjoy life and enjoy watching uh, others carry on. And I have no doubt that Iowa will surprise us. It's, it's, it's a very surprising place and it's surprised every mission that's ever looked at it. The conventional thinking is that there's no way there's life on Io. It's too hot. Well, it's only hot over 1% of the surface. Uh, there are certainly places with, with better temperatures. It's also thought that there's no water. Well, <clears throat> we haven't detected water but we didn't think there was water on the moon either for a long time until we got better measurements. So we might be surprised about that. And also, what kind of life are we talking about? The only thing we, we know how to talk about is life as we know it, which is carbon and water based life. So if it's some other kind of life, then who knows, all bets are off. So it's the surprises that will be the, the most fun and most significant.